Lobis. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Makoto Takano. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming here. I think uh, the, the number of the audience are much more, uh, more than I expected. Probably expected. Probably this is because of a uh, PR effect by the yes, but the plenary session. Thank you anyway. <laughs> and today's theme is the ESG investment. Um, I just want to start with uh, asking you guys, the audience, how much you know the uh, ESG. So please raise your hand. You know ESG. If you know the ESG, uh, what stands for? Please raise your hand. Okay, about 60%, so that means 40% do not know uh, about ESG. ESG. ESG stands for uh, uh, Environment Society Governance, right? And we are, uh, we, uh, today's theme is very important in these days because uh, this ESG is now kind of a mainstream or fashion uh, in the past two years. And the people here uh, uh, is the leader for, the, for, 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 for this category, particularly Mizuno-san. So um, I want to uh, uh, maybe start with uh, by knowing that the 60% knows uh, ES, uh, what the stands for uh, uh, ES stands for, but that, that means that 40% do not know. Means I think I want to start with uh, more like a general information, uh, what the trend, what the history, and uh, what uh, you know uh, uh, ES really means. Maybe I should ask uh, uh, Scott to uh, you know go over the overview. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be with, here with you today and also be with Kim and Mizuno-san, you for the second time, so that's an honor. Um, it, when I think about ESG, and it's very simple, think about it as a principle as opposed to uh, rules. And think about on the heels of the financial crisis, there was a lot of bad blood, a lot of ill towards capitalism. And so I think the principle of ESG, environmental, social, and governance, came on the heels of the financial crisis. And it was a way for business to dialogue uh, with um, the population about the good that capitalism does. And also to create a framework to talk in a more positive way about capitalism. And so that's the genesis of ESG. Again, environmental, what are companies doing around environmental issues? What are they doing around social issues? And governance around uh, structure. And so that, at a high level, is an overview. Of That's it. good. Thank you. So, uh, Kim, do you want to add something? Kim has been, uh, uh, you know, the Pimco. She is from Pimco, uh, one of the largest uh, fixed income um, firm, which actually I was there uh, in the past. And she was reading that the ESG uh, initiative at Pimco. So, uh, uh, can you uh, read that? on the top of what Scott said? Sure, so from an investment perspective, we've seen a, a big evolution in terms of clients embracing ESG in their portfolios. And if we rewind back you know, for decades, I mean, we, we as an asset manager are entrusted with client assets. Um, and so we're not making value judgments on, on where clients want to, to put their assets. That's done in their investment policy statements and then they direct us um, to do that. So. 20 plus years ago, we were managing portfolios, which we would call socially responsible investing, or SRI. This was kind of like the ESG 1.0, where basically clients just add a, asked us to exclude different you industries. You should say that the, what SRI means. SRI, so that's socially responsible investing. Um, and basically, that just means looking at the universe of companies and countries to invest in and excluding those that are inconsistent with value. So you can think of you know, industries like firearms, like pornography, like coal for some people. So that was the first part of it, which is just to take out of the universe um, you know, those industries that, that are not consistent with those values. Fast forward to today, um, and there still is an exclusionary component um, to many clients. They ask us to do that all the time. But increasingly, it's, it's also looking at the financial factors um, that are implicit in any kind of investment, um, but also the non-financial factors, looking at how a company is performing on environmental scores, on social scores, on their governance, um, as key indicators to how an investment will perform. Actually, as a risk mitigator, you know, as, a, as a bond investor, will you get paid back? 
um, by you know companies doing the right thing in this area, but then also as an alpha generation tool, can looking at these things actually make a company more competitive and therefore uh, add to a client's um, you know risk adjusted return. Um, so that's really where, where we're finding today what ESG means. Um, and then fast forward, the, the last sort of um, uh, frontier is what's called impact investing, um, where clients you know might have a particular interest in a, in a sector. You might think about clean energy, where they want to invest. In a, in a private equity fund that, that seeds you know, um, different companies who are invested in those specific areas where they have uh, a particular value that they want to invest in. Thank you. OK, let's move to our, our kind of discussion side. So we have a three uh, distinguished panelists, right? But also, uh, we have uh, uh, three panelists from each of uh, uh, different uh, uh, category, means like more stakeholders category. One is uh, Kim from uh, asset manager, and also uh, Mizuno-san from uh, as a uh, asset owner, and also um, the uh, uh, Scott is more for a financial audit uh, experts. Ex uh, experts. So maybe I would ask each of you that how uh, uh, the your job uh, is relevant to your job. Maybe starting with uh, uh, Mizuno-san, please. Thank you very much, Takano-san, and. Uh, very glad to see you all. Uh, and the two years ago when I started our campaign for ESG, basically no audience. So uh, <laughs> the, the year change in the, the uh, sort of level of interest in the ESG, I'm very, very pleased to see that. Uh, for asset owner, uh, actually when I became a CIO, uh, I tried to analyze the business model of asset owner. Conventionally, what the asset owner like a GPIF or the other public pension fund did is they spent a lot of time trying to find out the good asset managers and spend the majority of their time on trying to understand how they trade on the daily basis to find the other performance which will contribute to the other total portfolio. But when I analyze it, I just came to realize each asset manager cannot really make any difference to the, our actual performance for long term. GPF is designed as a part of 100 year sustainable public pension scheme. And uh, we invest in more than 6,000 companies and we own ma all major, you know, the uh, government uh, issued bond. So what actually happening is we just cannot be the market. We just cannot do anything to be better than the market. At the end of the day, GPF's long-term performance, which will affect our future of our pensioners, is actually dictated by how sustainable the system, whole system is. So uh, that's why I just came to realize we have to spend more time on how to improve the system sustainability. And I just uh, came across with the, uh, the concept of ESG as a very convenient tool to convey that message through the investment chain. When I arrived, there are a lot of discussion around the stewardship court or corporate governance court in Japan. And there are a lot of people criticizing short-termism existing at the company management level and also the asset manager level. But I just thought, you know, avoiding short-termism is not concrete enough message to say or convey to the other people in the asset investment chain. So I just thought ESGs are the factors which if everybody follows or trying to integrate that into their daily investment management, that actually foster long-term thinking at the end of the day. So uh, since then, I've been really advocating personally and institutionally that ESGs are most relevant factor for GPIF long-term performance. So that's what I think is the most relevant thing for our business. Good. And also that's the... Um, you know, I, I understand that you are, as a leader uh, in this category, you are leading, that means that you are uh, very uh, conscious about this. But what about others? Other asset owners uh, getting, getting, uh, coming to your level or not in Japan? Well, globally. Well, I think that globally, as I said at the uh, plenary session, that the, uh, some people are ahead of Japan. But the, uh, when I first came to learn about ESG, my, I concluded that this is actually very compatible with the, uh, the Japanese, you know, the business model or Japanese institutional cultures. So that's why we actually determined to push it hard so that Japan can be a thought leader in this particular field. So uh, 
I think it has been proven right, my strategy, uh, given the fact that we are now regarded as a thought, you know, the, uh, the leader in this field. But at the moment, we really struggle to get the other asset owner buy-in, and also even asset owner in Japan to buy into the, our uh, campaign. And the reason why is, people are so concerned about each other. You know, the, when I asked the, uh, the asset owner, what do you think about ESG, they said, oh, I haven't been really clearly instructed by our clients mm -hmm. to take the uh, ESG into consideration. And when I asked the, uh, the asset manager, they said, oh, again said, they are concerned about how the corporate leader will react to it. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to their corporate leader, they also concerned about how the Kedanen will react to it. <laughs> so it's a, they had a chain of irresponsibility, in my opinion. Uh, uh. So uh, <laughs> when, I introduced the, when we introduced the uh, three ESG indices for Japanese equities, one thing I really try to make it happen is that the, it will make the, uh, the project for everybody. So uh, I told the, uh, the index vendors, this ESG index itself is not sustainable unless Japanese corporate world would love to be in that index. Mm -hmm. And also we worked with the uh, labor union because this is the workers' capital concept. You know, workers don't want to use their own money in a pension system to be invested to promote the company or society which is against the long-term uh, employer labor relationship. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that, that we are getting there. And uh, if you remind me of two years ago, when I said E of ESG, I was swamped with all the criticism. <laughs> <laughs> but now for some reason, suddenly like a Nikkei and all the newspaper talking positive about our initiative of ESG after two years. So uh, I think we are getting there, but it's still Okay. You know, the, in the progress. That's good. And, uh, you know, um, Kim, you are, uh, move to, uh, let's move to uh, asset manager side. I, in Japan, as GPI is its largest uh, clients, probably for most of uh, asset manager, they anyway have to follow, right? The, the ESG uh, con uh, contents, the by, uh, maybe because of, uh, you know, too pushy uh, mizuno -san. But what about the, what about the, the uh, in general in uh, uh, globally? The, what the, what the, what the ESG um, you know relevant to uh, asset managers? What care about uh, uh, asset manager? Sure. So I think uh, I think it's three things to an asset manager. Um, as Ms. Nassan had said, you know our our clients are asking for this. Um, some of them have it hard coded in their investment policy statement that they want to explicitly um, target these things. And then when you look at you know the different decision makers, whether it's millennials or women, we know that they care about these things. Um, and so as an as an asset manager, we we it's not our money; it's their money, and we need to invest it um, in the way in which they 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 wish. Um, the second is, is also to Mizuno-san's point, um, which is the investment horizon. Um, whether it's a corporation or an individual investor, their investment horizon is typically quite long. And when you think about the forces that will impact um, you know, financial markets over the long term, E, S, and G are, are absolutely intrinsic throughout all of those. So not considering those actually gives you a, a less complete picture uh, of how you know, asset, asset prices you know, will, will ultimate to deliver. And the third, um, from an asset management perspective, is irrespective of whether our clients ask us to do it, if we think about how do we generate performance, risk-adjusted performance for clients, which is, which is our objective, um, we think that including ESG factors in our bottom-up credit analysis, how we look at companies, how we look at countries, how we think about macroeconomics that impact financial markets, will give us a better perspective and allow us to outperform more fundamentally. Um, and so that, that's to us is, is the reason that we have to do it, um, because it gives us a much more complete picture of, of, uh, of how we can add value for clients. Good, thank you. So, Barry, you know, adding Barry uh, from uh, from a uh, asset management point of view, also uh, is m uh, very important, right? And Scott, that your part is really difficult, right? Because uh, you have to deal with accounting and also, uh, you know, other. Uh, you, you need to speak with uh, the uh, government and regulator. And how what, how it is uh, relevant to you? Yeah, so we we think about this on two level ESG. Our global chairman and CEO Mark. Weinberger is a big believer in ESG, and we, we apply it to our own firm. So if you think about EY, we have 230,000 employees around the world. 70% of those employees are under the age of 30. 
and they're millennials, and they deeply care about what our firm is doing to support the environment. So we're one today, one of the top 10 business travelers around the world. So our young employees want to know what are we doing to create a better working environment using video conference, things like that around the environment. You look at social, what are we doing to help women rise up in the ranks? What are we doing to promote diversity? What are we doing around who we're procuring our, our, um, our resources from to make sure they're embracing ESG? And, and lastly, on governance, maybe I'll switch gears on you and talk about the second tier, which is our clients on financial reporting. So there's a coalition for inclusive growth that was started in uh, the UK, Lady Rothschild. And out of that, our firm is sponsoring an initiative called the Embankment Project to look, step back and look at financial reporting. And how can it be, today it's very historical cost-based and it's based in the past as opposed to looking at the future. And how can we as a firm start to look at ideas to shift that conversation to look more long-term? And so if you think about it today, if you understand anything about financial reporting, it's rooted in historical cost. And it does not really value intangibles that go on to the financial statements, which today in a high-tech world is where there's a tremendous amount of value in those intangibles. And so what can we do as a profession to improve financial reporting around um, having more of a long-term view as opposed to looking back? And so there's different things that this really touches our firm. And it's something our top leadership is very important applying not only inside our firm, but also with our key stakeholders. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. And then uh, I think um, the, you know, everybody uh, uh, agrees that the ESG is now uh, um, on fashion and important, but it may uh, change the, uh, you know, uh, it's very uh, according to the region, right? Japan, US, UK, and others are different. So here is some statistics uh, about the growth of uh, the uh, uh, ESG uh, investment. Uh, US, uh, uh, Europe is most, uh, it's $10 trillion, uh, no, $3 trillion, dollars, and uh, US is uh, $9 trillion, dollars, and Japan is small, only uh, $500 billion, but, uh, Growth is so different. Growth is uh, the Europe growth is uh, low, uh, about ten percent in the uh, past two years, and uh, US uh, uh, is uh, is uh, like middle, like twenty uh, thirty percent. But the Japan's growth is uh, six thousand six eight nine percent, right? It's, which means that uh, that's what nothing from uh, zero uh, two years ago. Now it's 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 really really going. So. Um, Maybe Kim, uh, I, I want to ask, uh, ask you uh, go about the, how uh, that, that, that picture and uh, map um, uh, changing uh, over time uh, because you've been uh, sitting uh, uh, in headquarters of Pimco uh, as a global organization. You can see the, the trend, right? Global trend. Please uh, a little bit touch on. Then I want to uh, go to. Uh, Again, that Mizuno stand okay. about Japan. Okay, great, thank you. So when we look at the at the historical trend here, it had it always been Europe and really Australia who had been um, trailblazers in this regard. Um, they've long embraced um, ESG and have been investing um, across various markets and integrating those factors for for many many years. We've seen the, an uptick um, in in Europe, as I mentioned, in terms of hard coding their investment policy statements, and that's been something in the last couple of years that they've been much more explicit about. In the past, they had cared about it, but now they had hardwired it into their investment policy statements. The U.S. has always been a laggard, um, frankly, and you know it, it is picking up more more recently. I think we could attribute that one to the regulatory framework. There's there's not sort of active regulation there that that would be the same that we see um, in Europe and elsewhere. And then you know the other you know big debate about ESG is you know is it is it value enhancing and actually proving whether integrating these factors it requires you to actually take a haircut on your performance expectation or whether whether these things can be, you know, uh, performance enhancing, and I think, you know, that's where a, a lot of evolution is taking place, um, which is the proof statement of, of how these things can actually improve a portfolio's performance. 
Um, so in the U.S., we're seeing you know things like public pension plans and endowments and foundations um, definitely pick up steam. Um, Ms. Dunas, I want to talk about Japan as, as, as the leader, certainly, um, here uh, with GPIF leading the way. Um, but you know, Asia has is, is, is been slower, frankly, on the, on the ESG side, but we're, we're seeing uptick there. When we look at RFP activity, whether for any mandate, not just an ESG specific mandate, we've seen you know over just over the past two years, two percent of of RFPs have asked how we integrate ESG into our investment process, um, and just this list last year, it's uptick to fifteen percent. So fifteen percent of any client asking you know Pimco to help them with investment management is asking us about whether we're considering ESG, and so I think that's an important trend that we're seeing. Good, thank you. So uh, coming back to Japan, uh, you know, uh, I want to ask Mizuno about more specifically about the GPF, uh, you know, the uh, revolution. I would say revolution. Um, in how did you make it? How you know? I think uh, you know, GPF has been uh, uh, there more than like 40 or 50 years. Right? Didn't move much, right? It's it's because of you, or what? What happened? <laughs> It was 100% because of me. <laughs> uh, I mean, um, to be, you know, to answer your question seriously, I think the, um, well, I started, but the, uh, as I said a couple of times, I keep per trying to persuade the people that what I'm trying to achieve is something what the Japan has been doing for a long time. Let's make it explicit. Uh, let's, you know, actually trying to affect the global trend of ESG using our experience, which hasn't been explicitly documented in the past. So I think, uh, to large extent, the, uh, the success of GPI of becoming, uh, you know, stepping up as a leader in the ESG field is just something, the compatibility of the Japanese, you know, the other uh, culture and the other, uh, what the values that ESG is looking for. And the other thing is I have been trying to persuade my team at the GPIF is I really don't want GPIF to be a leader in Japan. We just want to be a leader in the global ESG initiative. The reason why is we have to be always conscious about our too much significance in a Japanese capital market. So that's exactly what you just mentioned. When the GPIF says something, there's an automatic reaction, or if the GPF says that, we have to follow. I just don't like that, that kind of reaction because if they don't think why they have to follow or they have to think what's the principle we are talking about, it's just kind of be like obeying on the surface, but they're yeah, just not, not really following under, you know, the, I, I don't know the, the, any English expression to describe that, but I think just want to make sure that people agree to the principle we are pursuing. And the other thing is, uh, when the UNPRI asked me to run for the board member, they asked, they told me at the beginning that there is a one sort of reserved seat for Asian representative, and I refused to take it. And we I, we went for the global election for the board members mm -hmm. because I always think ESG is a global issue. I really cannot solve, we really cannot solve the other uh, sort of climate change by affecting Japanese people to behave better. UPRI. <laughs> yeah, UPRI. UPRI. <laughs> so uh, I think the, uh, oops. the one thing we have to be always aware of is, you know, that I keep reminding the people inside of our organization or the other stakeholder we work with, I'm not challenging Japanese companies only. We are going to send the same message to the uh, older global you know, the other uh, portfolio companies, and also, you know, as the manager we use, we now say, oh, there's a big argument uh, internally when we uh, release the uh, stewardship activity principle, should we just uh, make the for Japan and for outside of Japan? Mm -hmm. I really insist that we should create a uniform, you know, stewardship mm -hmm. principle so that we will send the message what we are telling to the Japanese company or Japanese asset manager is applicable to the, uh, like a PIMCO, which manages our money for the global fixed income investment. Mm -hmm. So uh, just uh, trying to uh, address the answer your question a bit different way, mm -hmm. but I think it's very important for everybody to think this ESG is not the market by market risk factor, it's sort of like a global uh, inherent risk factor of our investment. So. Uh, 
I don't want to speak too long, so I can I can answer about the index afterwards if you ask me again, but okay. I'll cut it here. But, but, but one, one question, the additional question: Where you are now? Uh, you know, uh, if you you, you want to do, uh, are you sat 100 percent percent satisfied with what the GP has did or, uh, in in this space or not? I think as far as the Japanese market is concerned, I'm about 80% satisfied with what we can do to start the uh, movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we are uh, looking forward to how the Japanese asset manager will react to mm -hmm. our you know, the, uh, uh, question on the table, how they address it. And I think they are very satisfied that the, uh, the Japanese corporate world now supporting GPFs, the, uh, the, uh, the movement for towards the, uh, the ESG integration into the uh, Japanese businesses. I was very, very, uh, you know, I felt so good when the uh, chairman of Hitachi uh, at the conference we organized with, together with uh, Nikkei the other day, he said, now I'm going to call um, our business strategy as ESG mm -hmm. management. So. Uh, you know, I just want to avoid the other sort of technicality of different wording, like ESG, PR, you know, ESG, PRI, like, uh, you know, the SRI and et cetera. But I think that it's important for the, all the participants, including the, uh, the who set the uh, reporting, you know, the financial reporting, uh, the guideline, to move toward the same value. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think in terms of direction we are going, I'm very satisfied. Good, thank you. So kind of, for, yeah. yeah, Scott. Yeah, just to your question to Kanasan, why, why did Europe embrace this first? I think uh, my experience in Europe is primarily a principles-based society, mm -hmm. whereas if you compare it to the U.S., it's very rules-based. Oh, I see. Uh, there's too many lawyers that enforce the rules in the U.S., and right now the environment in the U.S. is very much against regulation. And so without mm -hmm. those rules, a lot of companies aren't going to directly embrace a, uh, a metric. Now, that said... I truly believe uh, in the U.S. they're more focused on the environmental, the social aspects of their businesses and the impact that they're having, and they're starting to talk about those. What's difficult is finding that metric, which these two are experts at, I'm not. But I think that explains a little bit of maybe the different feeling between Europe and right now in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, in Japan, right, uh, besides GPF, do you see that the you know, um, as a whole, not only GPF, that's that the corporation or, you know, asset owner or, you know, those are stakeholders are changing and changing from UI. Yeah, so I think Mizuno said it, said it well. This is a perfect initiative to be led by Japan. Just think Japan corporations think about their contribution to society and think about their workforce in a more advanced state than many other countries around the world. Okay. And I've seen that living in Europe and, and in the U.S. certainly and now coming here. You know, the, the one thing, I th so I think on the environmental, the social, the initiative by Prime Minister Abe around women in the workforce, I think those are really positive. You know, I continue to, to uh, seek better clarity on the governance side, which is the management structure governance side uh, here in Japan, around financial reporting on the independence of audit committees, the reporting relationship between auditors and the, the audit committee, having financial experts on, um, on the audit committee. So this is something I'm pushing uh -huh. very hard with um, you know, the JFSA and, and corporates here in Japan. I think there's been a lot of progress and change. But when I think about the principle of ESG, I think Mizuno-san said it right. It's the perfect initiative to be led out of Japan mm -hmm. because it's really been a leader in caring for its workforce and its society and having more of a long-term view versus non-Japanese companies having a very short-term profit motivation. Mm -hmm. so in terms of governance, right, that's your expertise area, right? And, and uh, so you said that there are lots of progress, but, uh, you know, but when I look at the still like cases uh, on, on the newspaper, like, uh, you know, uh, some specific big name, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I, I don't necessarily agree that, that they, you know, it's changing, but it's very, very slowly changing. Is that, well, do you I, agree? Yeah, so I can't comment on that, but one thing I would, would say that was a fundamental shift is, uh, whether it's in, in the U.S. or in Europe, is many countries have moved to uh, where the senior executives, the CEO, CFO, actually sign the financial statements, oh. that if they're knowingly falsified, it's with criminal repercussions. 
And I think that was a very powerful statement when that was done on the heels of Enron and WorldCom and uh, really changed uh, the governance and the outlook towards financial reporting. So uh, again, Japan as a society is a very high integrity society. Mm -hmm. And so, and the progress they're making is very significant. I just think it's something we got to continue to push on. Thank you. And okay, let's uh, switch uh, the, the uh, discussion to a new one. Uh, you know, everybody here uh, believes that the U.S. is effective, but how? How it's effective, right? If that's really enhance corporate value, and what is mechanism? And second is why if that's uh, enhanced returns, investment return, or reducing uh, uh, risk, what, 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 what the mechanism, how do you see some, some kind of evidence? Maybe starting with Kim. Great, so ESG, I mean, it, it, is, it is nebulous. I think we're, we are evolving in terms of how we prove it out. Um, you know, we, we manage predominantly fixed income, and I think we think that ESG is particularly relevant there. I mean, as you think about what you're doing, you're lending money to, to companies and, and to countries, and so you want to be paid back. And so the downside risk is very important. Um, and highlighting some of these factors and how that can potentially, you know, help you steer clear of those credits or countries that, that, that don't have strong governance practices or are, are violating, you know, environmental um, activities or frankly not keeping up with regulatory issues or client demand. Um, will make them less competitive. Um, I mean, the biggest example you look back is is something like a, a British Petroleum in terms of their governance and, and what happened there and, and the downside risk that, that you saw. That's a that's a massive one, um, and it, but it's 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 more nuanced probably in other in other companies and countries because usually it's not the one thing that that makes them underperform. Um, it, it's the confluence of all those things. And so that's why understanding the broad set of these risk factors is really is really quite important. Um, our, our framework for investing to boil it down is, is we call it the, the three E's. So, so the first is exclusion, um, where we talked about that before is kind of the ESG 1.0, you know, practically you know, taking away companies that are, that are sort of directly in violation of, of ESG principles. Um, the second is evaluation, and it's really looking, in addition to the financial factors, each of our credit analysts um, on their one-page write-up has, you know, the typical financial metrics um, that you might expect, but then also spelling out E, S, and G so that they actually look at what are the risks, what are they doing well in these, in these areas, and what are the things that we should consider, and that's a more fulsome view of the credit profile that, that allows us to make better investment decisions. And the last is, is engagement. Um, and, and we're quite fortunate as, as a large fixed income manager that we have access to you know, the, the CFOs, the CEOs, the decision makers of major companies. And so we can work with them to understand you know, how are they faring on ESG um, and benchmarking those against their peers, less of a policeman, but more of you know, here's how your peers are doing, here's how you're doing year over year, then we can come back to them and say, gosh, have you made improvement on your board structure, your governance? Are you hiring more women? Are you more diverse? Um, are you keeping up with um, innovations and environmental technologies, et cetera? Um, all those things we think can, we can help really play a big role in, in driving impact. Now, the, the punchline is, though, that all of this is probably pretty slow. Um, but together, as an as investment management industry, with the backing of, of asset owners, we think we can make an impact here. But uh, ESC ha factor has been uh, mostly uh, uh, implemented uh, in the equity side rather than uh, fixed income side, right? How do you uh, see the difference? Or how, how, which one is better and which is uh, less better? Well, I think it's it, it's it's harder. I mean, the the uh, equity space has been um, you know one that has looked at ESG, and you can look at a lot of um, both firms and strategies that are invested there. But the opportunity set is very different. You have about eight thousand equity securities, um, and you have forty thousand fixed income securities. So the universe is just so much bigger in fixed income. There's also, I think, more risk factors that impact fixed income securities where having this broader picture of ESG is probably a better way to evaluate fixed income uh, investments. So for us, it, it's crucial. Um, and while clients are asking us to, to manage specific ESG portfolios, if we, I mean, if the end state is if we can influence 1.6 trillion of assets that our clients give us, integrate that into our investment process, um, then we think we can come to better outcomes for our clients. Oh, okay, that's good. Thank you. Mizuna-san, you have a, uh, any opinion that the, 
you know, if uh, ESG enhance uh, corporate value or investment return? Well, the, uh, let me ask, answer your question from two different perspectives. One is, you know, there's a, the uh, common debate whether ESG will contribute to better investment return right. for GPIF, meaning whether it will affect the uh, positive return from the portfolio which takes the ESG into consideration. And I have been criticized by in industry expert. There hasn't been any academic proof for that, the uh, positive attributes of the ESG factors. The first of all, when I hear that, heard that comment, I found it very interesting because in many industries, when the academics prove that's a good strategy, it's already finished. <laughs> but in okay. asset management industries, they think it, that their strategy has to be proven by academics to make it prevalent, which is surprising. But um, I actually decided to turn the discussion around by 180 degree, rather than trying to prove ESG integration will contribute to the positive return, but to ESG factor will at least contribute to the reduction of risk. And I found it very difficult to get a consensus among experts that the ESG is a positive attribute for the return, mm -hmm. but I found it very easy to get a consensus that ESG factors are long-term risk factors. Mm -hmm. So I just started with the other place everybody can easily agree with. So uh, in GPF's RFP for ESG indices, we made a one statement, which is actually epic making, but not many people uh, noticed the change. But I said, we are going to look for the ESG index, which will contribute to improve risk-adjusted return for GPF long-term performance. Mm -hmm. So uh, even if a return has, is, 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 is unchanged, if the return reduced, risk-adjusted return will improve. That's actually the big... Uh, the uh, strategic change in the way we, uh, you know, we uh, describe return, but that was the actually the uh, turning point so that the GPF can full heartedly push for this. Mm -hmm. And the, between the fixed income and equity, I personally believe that ESV is probably even more relevant to fixed income uh, or you know the uh, bond or loan mm -hmm. investment because the risk. Yeah, risk the, uh, the bond investor is taking, fixed income investor is taking, only the default risk at the end of the day. And if the ESG is a risk factor rather than opportunity factors, I think that should be more relevant to fixed income. We are going to launch the uh, joint research program with a big multinational organization very soon, how to incorporate ESG into fixed income. So that, that's my, my belief in that. Okay. So I'll take a little little different spin on the same question and, and say that it's a business imperative that companies embrace the concepts of ESG. And the reason I say that is because today the majority of the workforce are millennials. As I said earlier, 70% of our workers are under the age of 30. And they want to know that a company stands for something beyond just making money. They want to know the purpose of the company. That's why we lead with a better working world as, as a firm. You can see what Unilever or other companies do in, in this space. But this is very important to the next generation of leaders. And they need to know and hear from the company's leaders, what are they doing around the environment? What are they doing around social issues? What are they doing around um, uh, equity and pay and removal of conflicts, which is around the governance, some of the themes off of the governance. So I actually think it's a business imperative for all companies of all types to get behind these because this is what the next generation of workers is focused on. Thank you. Oh, Can I mention a little bit about millennials, yeah. how relevant they are to our business? Uh, it is project, projected that the uh, about $30 trillion worth of wealth will be transferred from the, uh, the baby, baby, baby boomers to millennials over the next decade. And uh, according to the survey, uh, the millennials and also women tend to achieve two things at once. Uh, the interesting survey result I noted, I, I, I looked at was baby boomer, for them to contribute to society, they think they have to focus on the work and the make money and then contribute as a philanthropy. Mm. And the millennials and women tend to think they should achieve, achieve both at once. And that's exactly how I reacted to the initial uh, counter, uh, you know, sort of negative reaction to my proposal for ESG, saying like, uh, you know, when they say, 
am I, you know, the uh, reducing return, or am I doing something socially good at, at the expense of the other uh, uh, pensioners? And I said, I'm going to achieve both. Mm. Right? I think that's a very different mindset, yeah. but the, uh, that's actually the other uh, shift happening in the world, and that mm -hmm. more people and more people are agreeing to the concept that we have to achieve both. Mm -hmm. That's good. I th that sounds like ESG would change the uh, view, right, uh, from uh, older guys to uh, new millennium guys. Okay, uh, you know, as we have uh, uh, less than five minutes, uh, uh, last question would be uh, maybe what uh, has been, uh, you know, what do you think that the ES ESG to grow faster? And in a way, uh, what, uh, to what level and how it uh, will be more uh, evolved? Maybe starting uh, from Kim? Sure, so I think maybe it's, um, it's three things again. Um, the, the first is that you know, we, we, we need to ensure that we have patience around this because some of these ESG trends are super secular. Um, and when people actually start, take a step back, and whether it's an individual investor or an institution, they also have long-term investment horizons. And we know that these things will play out over time. This will not just generate in the next six to 12 months. These are longer-term investments that we need to make. So patience is one of them. Um, proving it is the second, um, which is, you know, does this actually either reduce risk and or add return? And so that's why a lot of the innovation around reporting and, and coming up with attribution in these spaces is really important so that people People find find adoption, um, and then the third I think is the the holy grail at least from the the asset management perspective is that this is not a standalone concept. We're not going to be having this panel in three to five years because ESG is just part and parcel to how we think about you know properly managing financial assets um, for for any stakeholder, um, and it's embedded in an investment process and it's a standalone um, you know in parallel you know with financial risk factors and we look at all of them. And we and we can't imagine not thinking about them in terms of making an investment decision. Thank you, Mr. Uh, we recently discussed at the board of PRI uh, what the uh, the goal of PRI in ten years time, and they came up with a lot of different the other goals. But what I suggest to them is the ultimate success for the people like PRI who is advocating ESG is after ten years nobody need PRI. If the ESG become just uh, the other uh, routine, uh, you know, the uh, the business factors that everybody taking into account, nobody need that kind of you know mm -hmm. association to advocate for it. So that's my uh, ambition, and I think the other uh, all the people, not only the people on the panel today is moving toward that direction, but mm -hmm. this has to be collective effort, and uh, Japan cannot achieve it, the U.S. cannot achieve it by themselves. And also, the, uh, the investor cannot achieve it unless these guys manage to the persuade the regulator to improve the other uh, gap or like a reporting standard so that the, when asked the manager on behalf of us, look at the financial reporting, those ESG-related information should be there for them to make the informed decision. So uh, I just wanted to just to conclude my statement saying like, uh, you know, this is a journey for everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really encouraged more and more people believe in these are relevant factors. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not everybody yet, but I'm hoping that we'll be uh, joined by many people in this room. Thank you. So do you want to be uh, continuously to be a leader uh, as a GPI uh, in, uh, in this category, right? <laughs> oh, <sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best. Okay. Thank you. So I th just to conclude very quickly, the double entry accounting system is about 600 years old and it's changed very little in that 600 years. And this project that we're sponsoring in the UK, the embankment project, to look at moving from a historical cost reporting model to starting to have more disclosure measurement of some of these intangibles, I think that's a start on this journey and supportive of, of this journey. Um, uh, to have the financial reporting track the effort that companies are going through around ESG. Thank you. Okay, now it's come to uh, the question uh, answer time. So I want to have uh, two to three uh, questions uh, the, together and ask uh, the, each of the panelists. Please raise your hand. One, two, three. One, two, three, fast. This three, uh, fast. Sorry, I, I come to the, uh, this, uh, this side next. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hiroyuki Ono. I'm uh, managing a private equity fund in Asia. 
I'm investing in four Vietnam companies now. And uh, Takano-san's question, how is ESG affected? Probably I'd like to share one of my, uh, what I'm doing. So my investment is a proactive investment, helping Vietnamese companies connect to Japanese companies. Mm. But Japanese are very slow in making decisions, but long-term friends. Mm. But what, we, uh, what I found in the investment is that uh, the corporate governance in Vietnam companies is not sufficient for any of the listed companies to invest or cooperate to. That I'm always asking the, the companies to apply a big four audit reports or to have a corporate. It's, it's very, in these developing companies, uh, markets, it's, it's something very general. But having all this, educating this, will allow all the Japanese companies to be comfortable to invest into or cooperate. cooperate. So I found that for the governance size, that when we, Japan, I think connecting to the preliminary inception, that being a role model, especially in this Asia, is already there, that having this network in pli applying this is something that is impacting ESG. Mm -hmm. And that the question is that can we open up the, the investment from G GPIF or anybody for the asset managers? That does it have to be that the, for ESG investment, does it have to be a company already having foundations? I mean, these all these Vietnamese companies are not there yet, but they're having intentions to to grow or to build up the situations? And that do you think you can open up the, the, the investment towards these companies? Is that the question to and all the, all the good companies should be audited by EY. Uh, <laughs> yes, one of our portfolios in need EY. Thank you. Okay. And Chris. Hi, um, my name is Yurito. I'm from McKinsey. Maybe my question is towards Mizuno san and also Kim. But, um, how do you um, make sure that there is enough value creation in investing into ESG within the ESG portfolio? And my question is, um, for example, let's take environmental. And let's say within environmental, let's talk about automotive industry, right? Whether it was a debate that we're going to electric vehicles or whether it's to hybrid or whether it's to hydrogen cars, right? Within the environmental portfolio, there's even winners and losers within that game. So um, how do you kind of determine and making sure that um, even within the portfolio of environmental or broader ESG, mm -hmm. there is going to be winners and losers in how do you invest and get a return on investment? Mm, Um, Aki Matsui, work for PIMCO Japan. Uh, uh, maybe this question is to uh, Scott. And I want to know the more history about the ESG investments. And uh, the, according to Takano-san, uh, the European investor is uh, far away, you know, the, uh, with you know, 12 trillion investment, 12, 12 trillion dollars investments. And the U.S. investor is uh, 9 trillion dollars. And the, you know, the U.S. Uh, Japan has only uh, 500 billion dollars. Uh, what the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm missing you. No, no, yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> okay, and uh, you know, um, and my understanding is 16, right? That's not okay. Yeah. <laughs> my understanding is, uh, Japan is uh, far away, far behind uh, the Euro European investor and also uh, you know the US investor. The, what, what's the reason for that? So to who? Uh, Scott. Uh, Scott. Okay. So let's uh, uh, three of question. First question. Maybe Kim, you wanna go? Yeah. So on the, on the governance question um, related to, to Vietnam, I, I think that we have a, a, a big role to play, especially with emerging companies. Um, I think the, the biggest part is the engagement, um, and it's to bring you know other best practices of governance to companies to share what other companies and their similar industries are, are doing. Um, and that's where I think a more kind of constructive and productive dialogue as opposed to a policeman saying, hey, you're not doing this, 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 and this. Um, is is probably the the better way to to you know help those companies just do the right thing because in some cases it just could be that they they don't know how to structure things or or they're not they're not they're not seeing it and so I think that productive collaboration and the engagement is going to be key for emerging companies like that. And the second question was well, Mizuno or well, Akim? Oh, uh, first question, second question. Yeah. Okay, I'll I'll try to answer both then. Okay. For the first question. In ideal world, we want to invest into the company who has proper governance to begin with. But in reality, as Kim mentioned, there are different degree of the, uh, the quality of corporate governance across the different you know, the, uh, companies or different you know, the, uh, countries or markets. So what we are now focusing on is we actually urging our asset manager to improve the quality of corporate governance of the portfolio company we end up owning. But for them to do that, 
what the GPF we've been advocating for is asset manager has to have best in class corporate governance for them to have a strong discussion with the portfolio company. So uh, we are now paying a lot, increasing attention to the corporate governance of asset managers, including private equity firms. And the second question, which uh, uh, Yamaru-san mentioned, is that <laughs> you're right. Even if we make a lot of money out of Tesla stock, Tesla become, become very competitive, uh, meaning the other automobile companies stop going down, goes down. So it's sometimes zero-sum game. But we are hoping ESG factors can possibly contribute or produce a business opportunity which is, which is better than zero-sum game. That's one of my hope. And the, the second point I would like to make is, the reason I keep repeating, we try to increase the sustainability of the system is, you know, at the end of the day, GPF cannot really benefit from the one company create a totally new technology and wipe away all the other competitors. We just need to make sure the system continues to become better and better and more sustainable for long term. So uh, th that kind of discussions make the my job sometimes very difficult because the people who are trying to argue that ESG should be irrelevant or something even against my fiduciary duty to take into my job because of that consideration. But I think as a system owner, we should not pay too much attention to individual competition rather than the system as a whole. So just on, on your point about Japan being behind around ESG, um, I would take a contrarian view to that. I think it's not necessarily behind. I think in many ways it's a leader. If you look at the environment, it's the cleanest air in Asia. You look at the social aspects, you don't have people uh, sitting on the street begging and you have a very um, uh, gainfully employed workforce. Now there's more we can do around the support of women, which the prime minister's focused on. And around, um, you know, when you look at, at governance, you think about that Japan is a leader compared to many Western countries around addressing income inequality. So I think there's many positive things, and I 100% support what Mizuno-san said on the front end, which this is a perfect initiative for Japan to lead on, because it's aligned with Japan's values as a country around teaming and giving back to society. But perhaps maybe what I would submit is maybe that measurement of Japan's contribution on those fronts hasn't been appropriately or completely captured versus what I saw living in Europe or I saw living uh, in the US. So I think Japan is, is um, not behind compared to non-Japanese uh, countries. And I, I agree that there needs to be more initiative to lead this on a worldwide basis. Great. Oh, you want to add something? Oh, I just want to adjust the, the Se question. Second question. Okay. The second question. Um, so I think, I think Ms. Yusan answered it very well. And I think from an investment management perspective, I mean, we're, we're always going to look for a diversified risk profile. So that necessarily, you know, means there's always going to be a leader in the industry and hopefully we identify the right leader and, and we, you know, make money on that for our clients. But I think the, the bigger thing when it comes to ESG is, you know, you want to invest in companies who are either doing the right things or are taking steps to do the right things. Um, and if, they, if they're not, then that probably means they're not going to be competitive. And, and that means that either they're not going to pay you back in the fixed income concept or they're not going to appreciate um, in an equity con context. So I think it's a matter of, you know, engaging and talking with, you know, the, the leadership of those companies to really understand, you know, if they're, if they're not there, are they going to get there? Are they a future innovator in those spaces? And if they're not, then you should, that should be a reason for concern. Okay, two more questions from this side. Okay, so those two, please. Hi, uh, my name is Kei Sugawara from iStyle. Uh, we are running a, a small cap uh, uh, listed company. So this is the question from the corporate side. You know, the, I'm a shareholder, so I'm seeing the, you know, the investors every day, basically. So. I, I know the concept of the ESG, but you know, in practice, you know, I have no idea, you know, what to do. So it'd be great if you could give me some good example of, you know, the best practice from the corporate side of the, you know, the, the you know, okay. point. Yeah, uh, as a question. Sure, my uh, my name is Frank Packard. I'm with a, a boutique investment bank, AAA Partners. My question concerns the role of gender diversity in investment decision making. Um, there was a very sensational article, at least if you were a male, 
um, in the Financial Times this year that women-owned hedge funds statistically outperform men-owned hedge funds, which is, which is um, um, great because now it means that women are a statistically measurable advantage. But um, my question is to uh, gently um, push back against uh, gently, Mizuno-san, about applying global ESG standards to Japanese and overseas. How can you have the same application of gender diversity across global asset managers when there's such a, a multiple? Um, one of the uh, challenges is to promote and find great women in Japan, of which there are many, but getting them into mm -hmm. asset managers. And okay. to be a little bit cheeky, do you evaluate PIMCO better because there's more senior women there? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Nobu Tanaka, just I have a question to Kimberly. That uh, you said uh, some of the investors wants to kill the coal industry, for example. It, energy policy sake, the ESG investment would be very important. Uh, we will talk about it in the afternoon session in energy security and sustainability. But how do you kill the coal industry by exclusion of the coal-related companies or setting the carbon internal carbon pricing mechanism of the corporation or what or the CEO's attitude toward that? How to do that? Okay, well, we need to finish uh, within the time. Okay. So the each 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 question in one minute each. Okay, good. Shall I start? Yeah, please. Okay, for your first question, uh, this is the way I advise the companies that the, I have been you know, asked for the advice. Uh, you know, ESG is a little bit uh, investor-centric concept. It's much more difficult for the other company to actually to implement that into their daily uh, you know, business judgment. But on the other hand, there are uh, UN SDGs, strategy, you know, Sustainable Development Goals, which I actually have a little bit pinned today not because I support it, it's just because it's fashionable. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and the SDGs are 17 goals. It's much easier for the businesses to uh, use it for your, uh, you know, the business strategy. And uh, the message I keep sending is, if the other company use the SDGs to promote their future sustainable business plan, those companies will be evaluated highly by ESG investors at the end of the day. And the GPF came up with a slide with the other uh, two are actually the same concept, the flip side of a coin. And uh, now uh, UN actually used our slide to promote SGDs and uh, to the ESG you know, the, uh, investors. So that's the, the, my advice I can give it to you. And the second question about the, uh, how we deal with the, uh, the gender diversity. Whenever I say we are trying to be a leader in an ESG, I always have to just uh, try to avoid the, the uh, I, I, I beam from the women, <laughs> because I know Japan is behind the curve in terms of gender diversity. So that's actually the reason why GPF, this time out of three indices, indices we use the other women index, which is called WIN. And uh, that is the kind of trying to send a message to the global investor. Japanese biggest investors believe that the gender diversity is a relevant and important investment factor. And the second is, or the one thing WIN is better than the other women you know, empowerment index in the world is, Japanese government, because of the women empowerment law, they forced all the companies to release women participation ratio at a different level according to the law. And uh, MSCI used that database to create a WIN. So a couple of other market asked the MSCI to create the WIN version of like, uh, you know, the other countries. But the, I mean, she had responded, there is no database to make it happen. So uh, I agree with you. It's very difficult to make a universal standard. But the, uh, the for particularly in Japan, I think that promoting gender diversity is a very key element for ESG. That's why we are using the special index, index for that. Thank you. Uh, last question will come in, in 30 minutes. Sure. 30 seconds. OK, so, so 30 seconds. So, so I guess the punchline is is that we, we're, we're not going to kill coal, right? Um, and and the, the, the transformation from a carbon-based economy to something else is super secular. We know that. It's years and years um, in the future. And so I guess we would look at it in two ways. One, for clients who tell us that that's very important to them, we're going to exclude those companies. 
more broadly across the asset base, we're going to look at those companies to say who is investing in alternative energy sources, who are doing the right things to you know respond to this inevitable transition that's going to occur you know over the next several years, because those companies are going to be more competitive, and those companies are going to contribute to higher investment returns for our clients. So that that's how we think about it. You want something? No, I was just going to say we should have a round of applause for Takanos on his first time to uh, chair, facilitate a committee in English. So no, well no, done. No, 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 I'm mean, I mean English in uh, G1. Ah, G1 and G1. Okay. Okay. Thank you for listening to us. Because you, you did an outstanding us. job. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, I think uh, we had a very good discussion, but uh, please, uh, 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 please, uh, uh, you know, another <laughs> 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 yeah. I, I think, uh,